Bonjour. On va Good commencer afternoon. par un petit peu de lecture. We're going to Agnès start with a little bit of a reading. Agnès is going to read two pages from her latest Et novel, après, Le Château des Rentiers. Unfortunately, there's no translation voilà. in English. The, interpretation, ah ouais. the interpreters will let you enjoy the, the, the French. Récemment, ma grand-mère Tzila est venue me rendre visite, en rêve. Elle vient aussi me voir en pensée. Elle ne fait que passer, elle ne me parle pas, ne semble pas avoir de message particulier à me délivrer. Elle se contente d'être là et je songe que ce n'est pas elle qui tente de se rapprocher de moi, mais plutôt moi qui, sans m'en apercevoir, sans le vouloir, rien qu'en vieillissant, me rapproche d'elle. Je retourne au moment de notre première rencontre. Moi, bébé, aux grands yeux bleus, elle, femme de petite taille, au squelette menu, au trait fatigué par la maladie, aux yeux d'un bleu moins gris que les miens. « Cac crassi, voya !» Comme elle est belle. A-t-elle parlé en russe ou en français, penchée sur moi dans mon berceau ou au creux des bras de ma mère A-t-elle prononcé la formule yiddish propre à détourner le mauvais œil ?« Ken I know her. Il est plus probable qu'elle n'ait rien dit. Qu'elle ait simplement pensé « vivante, toutes les deux, sa fille et la fille de sa fille ». Soulagement, surprise, sidération. Je ne crois pas avoir été accueillie dans la joie. C'est sans doute ce qui a fait de moi un bébé, une enfant et une femme joyeuse. Il me semble que personne avant moi n'avait eu l'idée ou le loisir d'occuper ce terrain. J'écris « bébé » et je revois les lieux de mon enfance. L'appartement dans lequel mes parents se sont installés juste avant ma naissance trop grand, trop vide, qui résonne un peu, les meubles en faux bois couleur acajou, mes couvertures, celles au crochet d'un joli blanc crème et dont les bords étaient garnis d'un galon de satin brillant, ma courte pointe surpiquée en tissu synthétique bleu très clair et mon poupoun, ainsi appelais-je mon doudou, qui fut alternativement un débris d'édredon en nylon jaune pâle et une ancienne capuche moltonnée d'un blanc douteux ayant vraisemblablement appartenu à mon grand frère et qui procurait, lorsque l'on empressait l'étoffe entre deux doigts pour la faire glisser sur elle-même, une sensation enivrante, un bien-être fou. En écrivant, je me souviens de tout. Je fais semblant de me souvenir de tout. Peut-être est-ce la même chose, exactement la même chose. Je continue. Le couloir très très long, le visage de ma mère, sa bouche enfantine, les cernes sous ses yeux vert clair en amande, la grosse tête de mon frère, les cils noirs de mon père, les robes de chambre en nylon matelassées à grand col, les mains aux ongles larges et impeccables de mon père, la porte d'entrée à double battant, les épaules rondes de ma mère, les savates en faux cuir, les savates en tissu, une chaise à armature métallique. Tout est là, à portée de pensée. C'était il y a longtemps c'était il y a très peu de temps. Ainsi, j'en tiens la preuve, mon avenir, ma vieillesse sont eux aussi à portée de pensée. Si ma grand-mère me rend visite, c'est pour me le confirmer. Le temps de vivre deux ou trois choses et je me retournerai vers l'instant où j'écris aujourd'hui en me disant « c'était hier » et je n'aurais pas vu le temps passer. Si je ne prends pas un peu d'avance, je me retrouverai au seuil de la mort sans avoir rien prévu, sans avoir rien choisi. Merci, Agnès. Thank you, for, thank you very much, Agnès. I find this chapter says a lot about you and about this novel. First of all, you like to talk to ghosts. You're also a merry woman. Thirdly, the past is uh, within reach because of your writing, and uh, your future uh, will be happy in friendship. So let's go back to these uh, issues. Do you, have, do you like to talk to ghosts? Has it always been that the case? Yes, uh, you perceive this very well. I always felt that I lived uh, surrounded by ghosts, and I think it was when I wrote my second novel, Un Secret Sans Importance, there was a character called Sonia who was very close to my heart, and she died. She died uh, suddenly, uh, with, unexpectedly, uh, which happens sometimes, uh, although when you're in the author of a book, uh, you're supposed to be the one who decides, but I don't always decide. I don't decide if uh, 
many things in my books. Uh, Sonia died, uh, page 45, uh, Sonia's already gone. Can I continue? And I thought, well, it doesn't matter. She can come back. So she came back uh, as a ghost. And I remember um, discussing this with uh, uh, Olivier Cohen, uh, my editor. It was my second book that I published with him. He said, yes, it's great, it's great, but there is a problem, you know? Uh, ghosts don't exist, right? You can't really do that in your book. And I said, what? You mean ghosts really don't exist? He was a little puzzled and I said, well, I'm sure it's already happened to you. You're walking down the street. Uh, there's a bus stop a little further away. You see the little old lady with a handbag, a cricket hat, and you think, uh, Grandma, whereas in actual fact, your grandma uh, died 30 years before. Didn't that happen to you? And he said, yes. And I said, well, that's a ghost. And that's how I managed to negotiate my first ghost ever. But ghosts are comforting, aren't they? Yes, absolutely. They're not scary. They're not scary ghosts. I just mean to say that uh, the border between life and death is porous. It's not watertight. And uh, the proof is uh, in the excerpt uh, that I read out. Uh, people who passed away come and visit us in our dreams. And uh, it's a source of joy. And to me, dreams uh, are extremely important. Uh, it might be uncommon, but one day I realized that I spend uh, uh, just as much time sleeping as living. So it seems to be just as important in my life as the rest. And what happens uh, in my dream life, uh, uh, dreams, uh, terror, uh, happiness uh, in my dreams, uh, it's just as important as my life. I could include in my uh, resume that I often dream of um, flying, for instance. The uh, second thing is that uh, you're a happy woman. You're joyful. It's rare, isn't it? Uh, especially in writing, where people tend to be a little different. Well, in the novel at one point, uh, it's a hybrid type of novel. There are all sorts of things. Uh, there are uh, memories of the phalanstery that uh, my grandparents built um, by chance. Uh, there are also my memories. Uh, there are my projections, how I, my plan, which is to build a phalanstery of my own. And then there is my experience. And then there's there are the things that I invent. And in one of uh, the stories, uh, there's a literary critique. Now, I don't mention his name, but I mentioned what he said. He said, Agnès de Sartre uh, will write better once she, suff once, w once she has suffered more. Is that true? Yes, uh, that's what um, someone wrote about me. I was 30 at the time, and I thought this was extremely mean. And uh, it was rather dumb. What did he know about my life? Because I tend to smile, because I tend to joke, because I try and make light of everything that happens around me, he decided that uh, I don't suffer, I'd never suffered, I've got no idea what suffering is, but you can actually suffer and be joyful. And in a sense, I get the feeling that the more you suffer, the more you veer towards joy. Is uh, this something, is this uh, the result of uh, will, willingness? Well, it's my ethics. It's an injunction. It's the way I live. It's uh, oh, no one had ever had the idea of uh, occupying this place, and that's what made me happy, uh, joyful. I'm the child uh, of uh, two migration lines. There have been tragedies in the history of my family, and. Uh, when uh, I am born in a Western country in the second half of the 20th uh, century, 
My family uh, isn't rich, but we're comfortable. And very early on, as a child, knowing uh, the story of my parents and my grandparents, I realized that everything was fine in my life. And as a child, I said to myself, uh, I've got a happy childhood. I've got everything I need. And so there's no reason uh, not to express it. But I know it's uh, it's annoying for people, and it made me lots of enemies. Uh, I was kicked out of lots of places because of that, but I continue. But the, you mentioned the story of your grandparents. Uh, were you aware of it very early on? Yes, well, I, I don't know how I came to know about it. So my mother's father was arrested in 1942 because he was Jewish. Uh, he was assassinated in Auschwitz uh, uh, upon arriving. My mother was five. So I've always known it, but it's something that is passed on. And I say so in the book. It's uh, something that's passed on without even needing words to express it. It's something, it's not something that you hear about, it's something uh, that you experience in your body. So I've always known about it. But, um, uh, well, there's some question, there's some families uh, where it's a lament, uh, they complain about it in a special voice. It's absolutely not the case in my family. Uh, we also see that uh, the past uh, is present, it's within reach, uh, thanks to writing. Is that what make you want to write? You mean writing generally speaking? Yes. Very early on, I discovered that uh, writing makes you uh, sort of chief. You're the chief of time, chief of emotions. Very often as a child, uh, I, I got bored. And my mother would tell me, if you're bored, you just have to pick up a book. And I said, well, did you, do you I told her, do you want me to uh, be even more bored? But when I wrote stories, uh, I wouldn't be bored. And I was able to do things that are very uh, pleasant. Uh, I could write 10 years later. It's absolutely incredible. It's uh, as if you're a ballerina dancer and uh, uh, you dance on stage. It's absolutely incredible. You're suffering. It's cold. Uh, you're tired. But 10 years later, things have changed. It's absolutely fantastic to be able to do so. Or else you can uh, stop in time. You're with uh, the person you love. You feel that you might kiss. Uh, is it now? Is it not now, and you can drag this on for over a long, an extended period of time, over a month, and that you can only do through writing. Well, that's surprising. So you did not like to read, but you like to write. That's rare. I don't know. Did you write all sorts of short stories? Yes, all sorts of short stories, all sorts of stories. I wrote stories uh, against friendship. And I was a bit of a sociopath. I had a hard time interacting uh, with other children. Whereas uh, my children explained to me, well, all you need to say is, look, we've got the same shoes, and you become friends. And I, and I told them, well, I didn't have the same shoes as anyone, so I would write stories. Uh, there were all sorts of inventions. And, and uh, the other kids would tell me, oh, but you've got a horse uh, with wings. Uh, yes, absolutely. So it started that way. And then uh, came Mother's Day. I wrote a poem. My mother started to cry. And uh, that's uh, an incredible pleasure. Making your mother cry is uh, an unprecedented pleasure. And so, yes, I would write. Uh, I wrote a book which was uh, a parody of a book by Maurice Druon, a book, uh, uh, an anti-war book that had uh, impressed me very much. Uh, so I wrote a book uh, along these same lines. My father read it. He read it in front of friends. He was extremely proud. I was ex even prouder. And uh, at the end of the book, at the end of the reading, he uh, exclaimed, uh, good God, this is Marguerite Duras. And I said, no, it's Maurice Druon. I had no idea who Marguerite Duras was. 
but I felt that Marguerite Duras was someone very impressive. And then years later, I was telling this story, and uh, I realized we talked about it, and he explained to me why he thought it was Maurice, uh, Marguerite Duras and not Maurice Druon. So I would write books like that. But no, I wasn't a reader. I would read fairy tales. I was like my life with a ghost a prince that turns into a toad, a dragonfly who becomes uh, the queen of a country. Uh, that was absolutely normal to me. And then I turned uh, to children's books um, with um, kids who were able uh, to uh, build houses and huts. Uh, I thought they were extremely uh, organized. And then I started reading Balzac. Uh, there was talk about inheriting houses. I thought that was absolutely incredible. And these are normal things in life. Uh, the fact uh, that uh, you're part of uh, your family's history, that this family's history is stable, that seemed very strange to me. And I had to work to draw nearer to French literature. But I caught up since then. Do you remember the point at which you thought uh, it could become uh, your job? Yes, very early on. At first, I wanted to draw. That was my main interest. And then around uh, the age of 10 or 11, I decided I'd be a writer. Everybody would tell me, no, of course not. And uh, until very late, I said, uh, I would say, uh, I want to become a writer. I was uh, studying, I was doing research, and I would say, I'm going to stop because uh, I want to become a writer. I was uh, over 20, and uh, my professor would tell me, uh, who becomes a writer, you'll just get depressed. So they were all trying to uh, deter me from becoming a writer. But I remember when I was 14, I would say, yes, I will go to Apostrophe with Bernard Thibault, with um, Bernard Pivot and uh, take part in this uh, TV program as a writer, I was certain. Do all your books uh, start the same way? What is uh, the impulse? Well, it's like a summer storm. It comes as a surprise. The books come to me unexpectedly. I think the worst that ever happened to me, well, I always have very strange ideas in my head, but I'm kind of used to it. And then all of a sudden, there are strange ideas uh, that stay in my mind, just like a train that wouldn't leave the train station. And all of a sudden, I have this idea of men wearing uh, khaki shirts, uh, a rifle on their back, and dogs at their feet. And it stayed in my mind, and I thought about it. I said, oh, going to have to write about uh, I, I'm going to have to write a book about hunting no way but I had to and I did I wrote une partie de chasse which is a book that I loved and uh, that led to a beautiful article in le chasseur français magazine the article was absolutely fantastic and what was strange was that they would say that they said finally a writer who uh, doesn't make fun of hunting uh, I've never been hunting. Uh, I had never been hunting before. I've never been since. So these ideas come upon me uh, unexpectedly. To come back to Le Château des Rentiers, you're talking about a period of time that's not particularly recent. Can you sum it up? Oh, yeah, that would be a good idea. Should you do it? Should I do it? You're tired? You don't want to do it? Okay, I'll do it. Well, you'll tell me if I uh, omit something, but uh, basically speaking, I turn towards my mother's uh, uh, parents, uh, Tila and Jean-Paul Jampolski, uh, who uh, buy uh, an apartment rue du Château des Rentiers, hence the title. 
it was a good deal, so they told all their, all their friends, well, you should also buy an apartment there. And all their friends were uh, uh, Jewish people from uh, Moldova, from Bessarabia. And they had all lost a brother, a parent, a child uh, by the extermination of uh, European Jews. There were all survivors. And they all lived in this very modern, very ugly tower. And when I'd visit my grandparents, there were always friends around. It was an incredible atmosphere. And in my book, I describe this place, and I try to imagine a possible place where I would like to reside later on in my life. So these are the two extremes of this book. And then in between, there are dialogues, uh, dialogues with myself. Uh, there are uh, there are Vox Pops uh, with uh, older people. Uh, it's a very hybrid novel. There are stories, uh, uh, stories within stories. And it's autobiographical. Yes, in a sense, it's autobiographical because uh, I say a lot about my life. Uh, but the idea of this book uh, also came unexpectedly. I was uh, washing up. Uh, it's something that I recommend to anyone who'd like uh, to start writing. And I felt in my back the presence of my grandmother, Tzila, my grandmother. She was uh, often very present with me, but she was very much there. And all of a sudden, I felt felt it click, and I knew it was the book. I turned towards my husband and uh, my um, <laughs> sons, who like to watch me while I'm washing up, uh, while I'm washing up, and I said, I've, I've got the idea of my next book. And they asked me, what's it going to be about? And I said, it's about old people. Do you know, I don't know whether you know Charlie Brown, the comic, uh, you know how their mouths uh, go this way? And so I see these two people with their mouths that go this way, and I said, no, no, it's a great idea, it's going to be great. So there was my grandmother's presence, and then I think there are two other elements that came together and crystallized to bring about this book. Uh, all my life, I'd always lived with positive anticipation. When I was 18 months old, uh, I thought, I want to go to school. I want to go to school. And I couldn't stand waiting. And so my parents uh, took me to school. I uh, hadn't yet been signed up. And I hated it. But I, I, there was this eagerness in me. And I always wanted to do things. Oh, uh, I'm eager to go to school. I'm eager to learn how to read. I'm eager to learn how to drive. Uh, you know about uh, these stages in life, uh, uh, school, love, a job. And then around 50, the age of 55, I was thinking about uh, the next stages of my life, uh, uh, which would cause eagerness in me. And apart from the mandatory mammogram, there are other medical exams, but they're much less fun. I wondered how I could continue to live with this um, positive anticipation. I see my life as a trampoline. And I thought, well, maybe I could build a place just like the building in which my grandparents were living. And I could maybe imagine a place where I could live with my friends in my old age. And then the other element is that we continue to live uh, in negative anticipation. This is something I see in young people, in teenagers. I saw my, friend, my children coming back from school, and they were extremely sad. And I asked, uh, what happened? Were you beaten up? And they told me, well, uh, we saw, uh, uh, we started talking uh, about our professional future with the counselor. And uh, she told us that what we wanted to do are jobs that don't exist, uh, that there's no hope, uh, that there's a lot of unemployment. And I thought it was strange. These young people who are told you, you won't be able to do anything with your life, 
uh, I wanted to tell them it's almost the end of the world, so you won't have uh, longer to wait. So I wondered what, these atm what this atmosphere was about. And writing a book about aging and even about death, anticipating this, was a way of going against the grain of negative fashion. It's a borderline case. Uh, as in philosophy, I'm old, I'm aging, I ache, uh, it's all going very fast, uh, I'm going downhill. At one point, I talk about life and I say I'm going nowhere, but I'm going there fast. And that's the exact same thing. It's this, uh, it's this limit. We've got uh, very dark prospects, but we could imagine a detour, an underpass, and you can be smarter than that and create islands of resistance that are islands of joy. It's not unthinking joy. I'm very much aware. In fact, maybe it comes from there. I'm very aware of all the problems and tragedies that uh, of our day. But we have an incredible instrument, which is our, in our imagination. And it's urgent to use our imaginations now. So I think those are the three things that came together and crystallized into the novel. In your book, you explain that you go to see an architect, to the town hall, to try to get funding and authorization. Is this what you do in real life? No, no, I'm completely incapable of doing that in real life. I have no initiative. I'm completely unorganized. When the bank calls me, it's usually to tell me I have an overdraft. So no, no. I didn't do any of uh, these things. This is the romanticized uh, part of the book, the really fictional part, but I had an experience which gave me a lot of courage in 2000, uh, in the 2000s I wrote a book called Eat Me, Manger Moi, uh, with the opening of a restaurant which is a, based on a utopian social project uh, to do with children, poverty, other themes. And 10 years after I wrote the book, I was invited uh, to come to uh, the anniversary of Autre Chose, the, a restaurant, to, to celebrate Melissa's birthday. So I called the number on the invitation. I said, I don't understand why you're inviting me to her birthday. And, uh, the lady said, oh, I'm sorry, Melissa is an American lawyer who stopped working to open a restaurant like the one in your book. I said, a restaurant? Yes, it's been open for 10 years. It, it's in Paris, and we'd like to open you to the anniversary of the opening of the restaurant. And Melissa was there. I went to the, so I went to the party, and she said, is, 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 is I, this is why I put this in? Is that the way it was supposed to be in the book? So I was stunned. She had followed the book down to the, late, to the smallest detail. She was doing uh, homework with the children who needed it. Uh, the, she was helping people who were needed help getting documents. She was helping people with computer uh, issues, yoga, all of this in her restaurant. And she said, yes, I, this is based on your, leaf, on your book, Mon Chez Moi. I hope that this person will invite me again to another party. You said that the Chateau des Rentiers just happened to you and that it wrote itself, basically. Is that true? Yes, and that's not true of all my books. What does that mean, it wrote itself? And does that happen often to you? No, it never happens. It never happens. I always find it very difficult to write. It, just sitting down at my desk gives me uh, vertigo, not, makes me nauseous. Uh, all the questions flood in. Who do you think you are? Are you an imposter? And this hasn't got any better with, over time? No. But now I know that no matter whether these questions come or not, so I let them flood, flood in and flood out, and then I know I always end up writing the book. So yes, things have uh, changed a bit. It's become a sort of OCD. 
What does it mean that the book wrote itself? Well, the, I wrote it between uh, January 22 and January 23. Uh, we were bankrupt. It can, help. it can happen, so beware. So I was accepting any jobs I was offered, and I had been shortlisted for the Goncourt. When that happens, everybody loves you. It only lasts as long as you're on the list, but you need to jump into that uh, opportunity. You get commissions for articles, books, and I, I would say, yes, yes, of course, oh, of course. Uh, uh, when do you want that for? No problem. Uh, so I had all this work on my table. Somebody wanted to play. There was a children's series to write, uh, proofreading two, two translations, all of that the same year. And that was the year that I wrote Le Chateau des Rentiers. It was like a secret uh, thing that I would do. I was, was trying to do all this work that was going to bring in income. And sometimes I'd sit down and pull out my notebook and secretly start working on the book because it was so freeing and so personal. And I had decided that this was a, a book that would be for which I would be totally free. And that's how it was written, perhaps because of the huge pressure I was under in other parts of my life, perhaps also because there are a lot of um, uh, taboos that uh, perhaps if I had thought more about it, I wouldn't have been able to write about them. So this, this uh, book is also a sort of rehabilitation of old age or growing old. Don't you feel like you're uh, swimming again upstream? Yes, I've always felt that. So I'm used to it, and I actually like it. Uh, swimming upstream is uh, invigorating and very stimulating for your muscles. I don't know if you remember, but in one of my conversations in my mem, uh, with myself in Diablo, the, uh, the alter ego says, haven't you noticed that all the festivals say we want to attract a younger public? And I always find this strange that you want a younger audience because uh, young people are never interested in what you think they'd be interested in. And if you change the program, then the older people who used to like the program won't like it anymore. So why should we focus on young people? No, you should. Uh, the older people are faithful. They, they're still going to the cinema. They're still going to the theater. They still buy newspapers. That's fantastic. They are the best audience. So, uh, uh, do you think people who hold rave parties are trying to attract an older audience? So maybe that is swimming upstream. But I don't know, because as one of the uh, people interviewed says, uh, older, old people are getting older and older, and it's true. They're getting older and older, and there are more and more of them. And also, uh, it, it may be swimming upstream, but the very principle of uh, a utopia is not necessarily completely uh, against the grain. It's, it's because it's necessary. And at one point in the book, I thought, if I want to um, uh, convey this impatience, I thought, if you do your work right, you should, on certain days, be able to create the impatience of being dead. I'm impatient to be dead. And it's possible, it's a sort of hubris that writing allows you to create. What seemed crucial to me was to be able to take charge of one's destiny but our destiny is not really in our control, but take control of something in our existence and model it, shape it, or change it. I don't know if this is really what you'd call going against the grain or swimming upstream, but nowadays bookshop shelves are filled with personal development books. Uh, personal development, that's it. And people want to be better than they are. And I understand. 
But it also seems to me that literature is the only place where there's the freedom to be something other than what one actually is. This is what has always appealed to me. You can be a man if you're a woman, a woman if you're a man. I've been an animal, I've been a rabbit, a penguin. Uh, I've been a blade of grass. And the ability to do that seems to me not at all something that goes against the grain. It's something, it's the only thing left for us to do right now. Uh, with Le Remplaçant et Comment J'ai Appris à Lire, these are autobiographical in nature. Is it more difficult to read, uh, to write about uh, oneself than to write fiction? I don't know. I'm more of a fiction writer. My predilection goes for novels, and I've written a lot of children's books, hyperfiction, I'd call it because I can be a penguin or other extremely fictional characters. There are three books that followed each other in quick succession, sort of essays. They're between essays and autobiographical uh, books. And what's strange is that I don't uh, really have a different relationship to these books. You treat them like the others? Yes, when I, uh, I, after an event such as this, uh, like this one, a young woman came up to me and she said, you are, you have com completely revealed yourself. And I said, no. And she said, yes, you say everything in this book. In this book, you tell us everything about yourself. And I said, no. And I said, um, what you're saying is uh, as if there was a, photograph of a tiny piece of my hand, and now you're telling me that you've seen my entire body naked. There's always a bias. There's always an angle. Uh, and I don't recognize myself at all. I'm the, uh, the private person is never revealed. And the fictional element is always there. Even in the passage that I read at the beginning of the session, I'm, I remember, or I think I remember, it's the same thing, or I'm pretending to remember it's the same thing in writing, in life and in writing. Why do I remember myself sitting on the beach with my little yellow swimming suit, picking up a piece of algae, but I can't remember what happened one moment before that or one moment after? Why did my memory select that particular moment? So. Our memory is already a, a way of writing ourselves. And as soon as you put words on these memories, you have moved away from the real. Well, if the real exists, I'm not sure it does. As soon as you put words around it. So I don't think there's much of a difference. We get the impression that for you, literature and writing are uh, places where you're totally free. Is that true? You don't set any limits uh, for yourself? No. That's why I used Singer's, uh, Arik Basevich Singer's sentence, uh, in literature and in our dreams, death does not exist. It's a very precious phrase for me when we read uh, an author, it doesn't matter whether the author is alive or dead. It has nothing to do with the friendship we can develop with him or her, the feelings. Uh, if I'm reading Colette, Colette is right in the room with me. And I, I would almost say perhaps Colette feels uh, like she's my friend. Uh, Sonia, uh, for example, uh, died, but she came back as a ghost. It's a phrase that also contains permission, because death is the only real limit for any of us. We uh, are perhaps limited by our physical abilities, how high we can jump. But the only thing that is certain is that we're all going to die. So if we say that even this limit doesn't exist in literature, that means for me, everything, anything is possible. We can explore 
absolutely anything. We can go anywhere. We can go there any time. We can move around in space, in time, in our own body. I can't think of a single place where that is off limits. I talk to a lot of teenagers in my line of work, and I explain to them that one of the reasons that I write is because literature was the only space of complete freedom for me, including the freedom to be very cruel. And when I say very cruel, they uh, look a bit startled. In one of the first books I wrote, there were certain things that I wrote to um, avenge myself, of uh, people who had been mean to me, uh, as I did with uh, this uh, critic who said, Agnes will be a better writer when she suffered a bit more. I put that in a book. There, take that. There's an obstetrician. Uh, when I was pregnant at age 46, he did an ultrasound, and he said, we're not going to let this uh, fester inside you. I thought, hmm, that's really cruel, and maybe I'll use that in a book. So the only thing you have to do is make sure that you tell it well. But other than that, the sky's the limit. If you decide that you're going to, uh, like some people do, they have a, put a tiny garden up on their huge piece of land, and they feel like they have to fence it in. I always find that interesting. Uh, you can you could move those fences. You could uh, cultivate the whole piece of land. Uh, so the only that's the only space I know that's completely free. When you write for teenagers and children, is your approach the same? Yes, I never know how it's going to end. I don't know what I'm going to talk about. I have no plan, I have no outline. What else? There are pitfalls. No, I don't see any difference. You're also a translator. It's, it's a big part of your work. Does this bleed into your writing, infuse into your writing? Uh, when you're looking at other people's words, do you undergo an influence despite yourself? Or, well, all everything you've said is true, but the influence, I would say, is accepted since I'm fortunate enough to translate fantastic writers. In fact, I choose what I'm going to translate. I can refuse translations. Who have you translated? Virginia Woolf. John Steinbeck, Hisham Mata, who was here yesterday. I've translated many authors. Alice Munro. These are major writers, yes, absolutely. Isn't it too daunting? No, not, not at all, because I know what a writer is. Writer is a, I mean, I'm a writer. There's nothing surprising. The person doesn't uh, is not daunting. The book may be, but, uh, uh, but I'm as detached when I translate it as I am when I write. So not only am I influenced by their work, but I want to be influenced. I want to become a better writer. When I translate, I'm not a writer. I'm only a translator. I have no personality. I become the person who wrote the book. Sometimes I even feel like I'm starting to resemble them. I imagine myself as I'm looking at this and book and translating it that I look like this person. And I try to, uh, because I usually translate from English, sometimes for, for Virginia Woolf, if I translated the words, it didn't work. So I had to go back to before the words, to the moment where she had the vision, because she worked on the basis of vision. So I had to get, put myself into the state that she was in. And when I could see what she saw, I could start writing. And then when I looked, all the words were there, but they were organized differently. So. It is an influence. It's enriching. It, I learn a lot. 
uh, I didn't know about uh, elliptical form forms. Uh, so w w I, I would uh, Lois Loric. Eloise Loric was the children's author who I translated, who taught me about this. Uh, it was when I was a beginning writer. I know that this is what I've learned, but for each author, I learned different things. Uh, and changed, it's changed my work. Aren't you worried about uh, parody, parodying or... No, because if we all have our own personalities. Uh, and that's a bit tragic because every time I ha have an idea for a new book, uh, as long as it's still an idea, uh, I'm not invested in it. It exists in this uh, iridescent bubble. Uh, but as soon as I put the first words on paper, it's just me, just me and the page. And that becomes difficult. So uh, even when I wanted to you see, when I tried to parody Maurice Duon, everybody thought it was Marguerite Duras. The theme of this uh, festival is love. Uh, do you read uh, romance, romantic novels? I, I don't read no, I, novels for what genre they are. I like to read books by good writers. Uh, some people say, oh, I can't read that book. It's too sad. I'm, I'm only sad if I read a book that's no good. Uh, but a good book makes me very happy. So I don't really have a genre when I read. There are books which I call submarine books. I don't know if you remember when we were little, those films on TV with men in submarines. What's going on, Commander? I don't know. I'll go see uh, a periscope. They were all rushing around like headless chickens. There were no girls. And I thought, oh, this is exhausting. So I invented a category, which is submarine books, books where there are only men rushing around uh, in a state of disarray. So those might be the only books I might find it hard to read. But otherwise, I read a bit of everything, science fiction, crime novels, uh, love stories. The only thing that's important is that when I open the book, I can hear a voice. A uh, specific voice. And I'll say, oh, whose voice is this? And that will draw me into the book. And then it doesn't really matter what the book's about. Yes, but sorry, uh, back to the topic. Love is very important. Well, thank you, Agnes. Perhaps we have just uh, a time for just a few questions from the audience. If you like, there's a microphone that you can take. And at the end of the event, Agnes will be signing her book upstairs. Thank you. Who wants to ask the first question? The first question is always the most difficult. Well, very surprising. A lot of surprises. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but there's one floating in my mind. Has literature ever had any limits for you? Have you ever been tempted to move into areas that are off limits to literature that can't be expressed in the same way that they could in painting or another art form? Well, literature, uh, for me, when I'm producing it, it's an unbearable limit, but I have to, I have to accept it. I'm always frustrated to, as Virginia Woolf said, and sh her sister was a painter, she said she had the curse of uh, being born in the world of words. 
which is an inferior material. In the exhibition that's upstairs here in the foundation, I was interested to see that Simenon had the same opinion as Virginia Woolf, and there are not two, no two writers are so far apart in terms of genre, but he said that what's specific to literature is that uh, the material is uh, the same material that you would use to write out a bill or to, uh, it's the same material that's used to pay a bill and write poetry, whereas painting uses a material that isn't being uh, denatured by everybody all day, or music, for example, uh, that's not, requires a certain expertise. What, what is the expertise required of a writer? Everyone writes, every, everyone can write, everyone speaks. So often I say, well, what, what I'm trying to do is not working here. Uh, I, I need music to do this. And sometimes uh, I see that the art itself is limited. But these are challenges, and challenges are always interesting. It's interesting to confront the difficulty of how to manage with my ability and only one material, which is words, uh, to do what another art form can do. So often I'll use another art form while I'm writing. That's a very, uh, a very fertile approach. For me, I can, I can f see and I can grasp total freedom within, uh, even though this limit exists. Any other questions? Well, let's go up and sign the books. OK. Oh, there's a gentleman here. It's not a question. It's a comment to thank you. Several times you said, I like to go against the grain. It's stimulating. Did you know that in rivers near here, there is a very interesting bird called the dipper that uh, dives into the water, walks on the riverbed against the current. Why? Because that is where the food source is found. If the bird was heading in the other direction, the insects would go past the bird. They wouldn't be able to catch them. So I think that this is a very interesting comment that you made and very good advice. Thank you. Well, we're getting closer to personal development here. Yes, I, I think there. Uh, I was lucky with this book. A lot of articles were written about it, and every uh, article was titled How to Grow Old in Good Health. Uh, uh, and I, I thought this is something, this is like something from a review for older, the elderly. Uh, if I read this article without knowing what it was about, I wouldn't buy it. I wouldn't even get it out of the library. So, but the Dipper, that is magnificent. I love the, the Dipper. So, Yes, so nothing like animals and animal poetry. Any other questions? Thank you. Do we have time? I don't know. Where are we with time? Five, five minutes? Can I read something else from the book? Yes. The interpreters will let you listen to the French. Unfortunately, the book hasn't been translated into English. So I'll... I'll give you a five-minute reading. That way you can understand who the characters in the Château des Rentiers are. Tout le monde avait souffert. Sur certains poignets, on lisait une série de chiffres tatoués. Je n'ai su que des années plus tard ce que cela signifiait. Dans le parler des habitants du Château des Rentiers, la lettre U n'existait pas. C'était soit I, soit OU. 
Je me rappelle les longues séances au cours desquelles nous tentions de rééduquer ma grand-mère en lui faisant prononcer après nous. « Non, mamie, pas biche, bûche. » Et elle, c'est ce que j'ai dit, biche. Et elle montrait une bûche. Je ne l'ai jamais vue en colère. Elle chantait « Pieds tout choc » et « Kozlik », des comptines russes que nous adorions. Je n'ai découvert les chansons yiddish que bien plus tard, par la famille de mon mari. Mes grands-parents étaient russophiles, ils aimaient les poètes russes, la musique russe. Sur les photos d'avant-guerre, ils figurent en maillot de bain, les filles ont les cheveux courts, elles tiennent les garçons par le bras, ils forment une bande. Je m'imagine qu'ils sont au bord de la mer noire, ils ont l'air très heureux. Ils n'ont aucune idée de ce qui les attend. Les bastonnades, les puces, le froid, les coups de fusil, le typhus, les chambres à gaz, la faim, le massacre, un nouveau massacre, un massacre de plus. J'ai mis longtemps à comprendre le sens du mot « pogrom ». Je n'osais pas demander. Jusque très tard dans ma vie, j'ai continué d'avoir ce problème, ne pas oser demander, parce que j'avais honte de ne pas savoir, de n'avoir pas écouté quand il était temps, de ne m'être pas documenté, de n'avoir rien retenu. Si j'avais été sérieuse, j'aurais posé des questions, je me serais intéressée à ces gens, mais je pensais qu'ils seraient là pour toujours, comme mon enfance qui durerait éternellement. Je ne parviens pas à regretter mon ignorance. Je me suis si bien habituée à ne pas savoir, à tout imaginer. Je ne conserve que ce qui m'importe, je ne garde que ce que j'étais réellement capable de comprendre sur le moment. Les Umentaschen, oreilles d'aman, pâtisserie aux graines de pavot préparées à l'occasion de Purim, la fête d'Esther le gâteau aux noix, le gâteau à l'ananas, la tarte au fromage blanc et aux herbes. Parfois, c'est toujours une surprise, un hasard, ma pâte brisée a exactement le même goût que celle de ma grand-mère. « Salut, Tzila » dis-je dans ma tête. Ces autres préparations, je ne les maîtrise pas. Un après-midi, alors que j'étais venue lui rendre visite dans son appartement, je lui ai demandé de me donner la recette du gâteau aux noix, mon préféré. Nous nous sommes installés dans sa cuisine, elle a sorti plusieurs petits saladiers, son batteur, dont le moteur chauffait vite, répandant une merveilleuse odeur de plastique brûlant. Puis, elle a disposé les œufs, les œufs la farine, le sucre, le sucre, l'huile, l'huile, les noix, le cacao, la margarine. « Combien tu mets de farine ?» lui ai-je demandé. « Un paie » a-t-elle répondu. « Et combien de sucre ?»« Un paie. »« Comme la farine alors ?»« Non, pas comme la farine, un paie. <rire> » J'ai laissé tomber, elle a ajouté l'île, elle a bâti avec le batteur, elle a cuisiné dans sa cuisine, à sa façon qui ne serait jamais la mienne, et j'ai accepté de perdre pour toujours la saveur de mon gâteau préféré. J'ai accepté l'idée que quand elle mourrait, le gâteau mourrait avec elle. J'en mangerais volontiers un morceau aujourd'hui, mais il ne m'a pas manqué durant les 28 années qui se sont écoulées depuis la mort de ma grand-mère. J'en mangerai une part aujourd'hui avec grand plaisir, parce que j'en parle parce que, comme je l'ai écrit, j'ai à présent l'âge que ma grand-mère avait quand nous nous sommes rencontrés, pour la première fois. Je n'ai noté nulle part les paroles de Pietuchov, pas plus que celles de Kozlik. Je me rappelle la mélodie, quelques mots, des bribes. Pietuchov, Pietuchov, Zalatoy Grebyshok. Gilbilio babushki serinki Kozlik. Vodkak, vodkak, serinki Kozlik. Babushka Kozlika, ochen Ljubela. Vodkak, vodkak, ochen Ljubela. Le reste, presque tout le reste. Je l'ai oublié. Des gâteaux et des chansons seules demeurent, de bouche à oreille. Voilà.